Uh, debunking fake science is probably something I spend too much time on, but you know, sometimes it's good to share the goodness. But first of all, who am I? Because I've not been at too many live events of the club for quite a long time. This is what I looked like back in January 2020, just before COVID found its way to these parts. So mostly when I'm seen in public, I tend to look a little bit more like this. So what qualifies me to talk about science? I'm a computer science academic. I have a PhD. I do research courses, all the usual. And uh, as I said before, spend too much time debunking junk science. So for those interested, you can find me on Google Scholar to see the kind of stuff I do in terms of research. You can find me on the Rhodes University Computer Science Department website where I've got a bunch of stuff up about the kinds of projects and courses I do. But the critical thing is not my qualifications, but my view that academics need to engage with the public and policy. If we understand things that are hard for the general public to understand, we need to help out. So on now to a few basics of what makes science fake or not. You need to understand a few things like what propaganda is, astroturfing, memes, distance, difference between denial and skepticism. So once you have that out of the way, we can go on to some examples. The propaganda generally has a kernel of truth to it, to, to hook people in, but it's deliberately misleading. It doesn't have to be about mass audiences, <clears throat> professional media and so on. It just have to use psychological tricks to con people into believing things that are not true, starting by a kernel of truth and leading them away further and further into La La Land. Now, astroturfing is a particular technique that often applies to propaganda in the days of the internet and social media. It's a fake grassroots movement, hence astroturf. And it promotes a point of view while obscuring who's pushing it. So it can be particularly powerful. So you might get it popping up, for instance, as comments on an online discussion forum that appear to be from a bunch of concerned citizens, but they're actually people paid to post those comments. It gets even more interesting with things like Twitter, where you can get things called bots, which are pieces of software that automatically post tweets to fake the effect of being a mass movement and they're not even real people. So memes are ideas that take on a life of their own and replicate over the internet, often amplified by social media. So the final bit of conceptual background is the distinction between denial and skepticism. All scientists are skeptics. Most scientists love nothing better than to read a paper by highly esteemed colleagues in a top journal and discover they forgot to carry the one and the whole thing is junk. Denial is different. Denial is closed to contrary positions. A true skeptic is open to all possibilities, not just the positive being correct and the negative incorrect or vice versa, but they really look for flaws in all directions. And also denial carries with it absolute certainty about your preferred view, whereas a true expert, in fact, is often quite uncertain about the true position and is always looking for more evidence. And yet, if you are not somebody who regularly works for science, certainty sounds more expert. So this sort of denial or propaganda goes back a long way. There have been many anti-science movements not just in the last century, but going back even further. Propaganda in its modern sense was perfected by the Nazis. They were the first to use mass media and large cards and so on. But the ideas behind this have been extended for, in many directions, not just politics. For instance, big tobacco is a good example. So let's, for instance, look at a nice book. Those who like reading, and I guess most members of this club do, Look for this book called Merchants of Doubt, and it covers the whole history of how uh, a bunch of hired guns who, in some cases, were quite respectable scientists, worked to obscure the issues in tobacco and moved on to other causes like climate change. 
So let's then look at a few examples. And I'm going to focus mostly on epidemiology because it's current, but we'll look briefly at tobacco and health, AIDS denial, climate change, the anti-vaccination movement, but more specifically the instant epidemiology experts. And so the tobacco and health movement started by emphasizing uncertainty in the science, underplayed the industry's own research showing risks, and it aimed to undermine public confidence more broadly in science so that attacks on tobacco would be seen in a broader context of, oh, you can't trust these people. It's always scientists trying to make a big deal out of nothing. So it did deliberately target a range of issues, not just tobacco. AIDS denial is a slight outlier here because there's no obvious industrial interest in this, but also overstated unknowns ignored contrary evidence and relied on justifiable distrust of big pharma. That's the kernel of truth in climate change. Again, overstated the unknowns ignored contrary evidence and relied on distrust of big government. And then finally, the anti-vax movement overstated unknowns ignored contrary evidence relied on justifiable distrust of big government and so taking contrary evidence for instance there was a claim that the MMR measles, mumps and rubella vaccine was linked to autism when the evidence was further studied and was shown not to be in effect this was simply ignored and the early study that showed it was which was subsequently shown to be academic fraud trumped all of the better studies and you know, distrust of big pharma is well founded in many cases. It doesn't mean that every instance of pharm pharmaceuticals is to be distrusted as a consequence. So instant epidemiology experts, again, overstate unknowns, ignore contrary evidence, and rely on distrust of big government. So why all the similarities? Well, much of it draws on the big tobacco uh, playbook. If you go back to the 1980s, a big lawsuit forced masses of documents out into the open. There's a whole trove of these things now which you can study and search to find information about how they did all this, and you'll find also pointers to how they made it a more general thing, not just attacking anti-tobacco science, but any other science that might attack industrial concerns, the ozone hole, climate change, etc., etc. And so other industry lobbies picked up from where they left off, including uh, fossil fuel funded anti-climate science, so-called science. But not as much of that has been brought out into the public. Uh, so first reading Merchants of Doubt in order to pick up all the links. But if you want to study in meticulous detail all the big tobacco documents, there's a website where you can do that. And uh, if anyone is interested, I can send these links in later. So let's now go back to the pandemic though. So I'm going to focus on instant epidemiology experts and also instant pharmacology experts. So epidemiology is hard and pharmaceutical research is also hard, I should add. People spend lifetime careers on this. Models are complex but they're based on long-established science that's been applied to many other epidemics in the past. And so what I'm going to do is illustrate a few basics in a bit more detail than things I've talked about before, and then a bit about how people get it wrong. So what drives the spread of a contagion? So first of all, how contagious is the virus? How long is an infected person contagious? And how does society mix so if you combine all of these things together, you can calculate a number called R0, which is called the basic reproduction number. So if you look at how many new infections you get per infected person, when everyone they encounter is still susceptible, that's R0. And so let's now say, well, okay, what happens now when some of the population is no longer susceptible. Perhaps they've been infected and recovered. We now adjust the whole thing to include that additional factor, and we call it RT. Some people just call it plain ordinary R. If you've been following, for instance, British government 
uh, media briefings, they often re used to refer to the R number and talk about it being below one as being the target. And that's called the effective reproduction number. It's the new infections per infected person at a particular time, taking into account all these factors that not only include how many are still susceptible, but possibly counter measures. So if you look at the effect of containment measures, then what can we use? Well, we can use information about how contagious the virus is. And that was constant for quite a while. And then around about October last year, more contagious variants started to emerge. And those more contagious variants take over very fast because they outcompete the less contagious ones. So if we now look at how long a person who's infected stays contagious, that again is not something that has changed very much because we haven't found any effective antiviral drugs. We've got a fair number of medications we didn't have at the beginning that treat the symptoms, but that's not the same as directly attacking the virus. So on then to how much society mixes, well, R0 depends on a particular society and how much it mixes, but it gives us a basis for non pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs, and that's masking, distancing, hygiene were the three big ones at the beginning of ventilation, is also a significant factor. So if you implement these measures, you fake the effect of a less contagious disease. You have not actually changed R0 because you haven't changed the underlying disease or society, but if you attack these things, you can slow down the spread. And so we look now at how much the population is still susceptible. The first effect is immunity after infection. And studies have shown there's quite a low rate of reinfection. So a few people do get infected again, but not many. And then vaccination can stop it a whole lot faster. And new variants are a potential big risk factor of vaccination, which is a good reason to get people vaccinated quickly because the infection is spreading faster, there's more opportunities for it to uh, mutate. And once it mutates to a more contagious variant, that tends to take over very fast. And finally, out of our checklist, what are we doing to contain the spread? And NPIs are the name of the game, and they mostly address mixing. What's very important to understand about these things is that if we relax them, and we stop faking a less contagious disease, and the effect of that is remembering underlying R0 hasn't changed, that RT can shoot up again very quickly. So, let's look at misconceptions. Are there waves? Well, I'd argue no, it's not waves. It's all one wave, but we suppress it, and then it comes back and we ease off. That's different from the seasonal flu, which eventually damps down but comes back again because it's going around the world and comes back again, possibly with new mutations. So what I'm going to do is a few runs of a simplified epidemiology model. It doesn't include a number of important features like modeling the difference between getting the disease mildly and getting it seriously and needing medical intervention. It also doesn't count deaths. And you think deaths are a very important factor, but in fact it's a very small fraction of those who get sick. And the important thing is how fast it grows. Because if the number of infections grows very fast, that's when we overwhelm the hospitals and we end up with a situation where uh, people who could be saved end up dying. So first I'm going to run it without interruption and then look at how we can make it make waves. So first of all, let's just look at how the simulation is configured. It's set up so that an average an infected person infects somebody else every four days, and it takes 10 days to go from infectious to recovered, and there's an in-between state of exposed where you, you take a few days to become infectious. So with those settings, R0 is 2.5 because it takes you infectious for 10 days, and on average you infect somebody every four days. And so let's just let this thing run through to the end. It'll run for about 30 seconds. And at the beginning, you see not too much is happening. The dashed line you see developing just about the top half of the screen is the herd immunity point, which are these 
numbers is at 60% of the population. And you'll see that the red curve peaks uh, at the point where the gray curve crosses the herd immunity level, but people still carry on getting infected after that. And what we see when we get to the ed end of this thing is almost 90% of the population has been infected by the time it ends. So the important takeaway from this thing is that herd immunity is the turning point of the graph, it's not the end point. So if, where people are talking about 60% herd immunity, if you were to get there by just letting everyone get infected, you would actually end up with almost the entire population getting the infection. And in real situation, R0 varies quite a lot, 2.5 is just a typical value. In a society with more crowding, more mixing, it would be higher. In a low-density society, more rural, for example, it would be a lower number. So herd immunity starts when RT reaches 1, and it, in principle, should only go down from there unless you make it easier for the disease to spread. In other words, you start mixing more or it gets more contagious. So overshooting then makes herd immunity by infections a bad strategy, but for vaccines, it's a much better way to achieve herd immunity because if you vaccinate up to the herd immunity point, then if you get localized outbreaks, it goes away quickly and doesn't spread very far. Now, because we have a more contagious variant, 60% is a bit of a low target. We're probably looking at more like 70, 80% coverage of the population would be ideal to avoid future outbreaks and more is better. So let's look now at what effect it has if we make intervention. So I'm going to let it run for a while and then get to a point where we decide, oh dear, cases are rising too fast, let's uh, implement some NPIs and instead of infecting one person every four days, <coughs> we'll slow down that rate dramatically. So let's see how that goes. So as before, at the beginning, not too much is happening and then the pink curves will start to grow and we can just start to see them now in the bottom edge of the screen and if we were zoomed in on a, big, on a closer scale we'd see this is rising pretty rapidly and we start to panic so we stop we make an intervention maybe a lockdown now people who get infected are only passing on average every 20 days which would make it equivalent to R0 being 0 0.5 which is not a very contagious disease at all and the R value is well below half so it starts shrinking really fast and this is a more instant effect than a real lockdown because we couldn't do that instantaneously and now numbers are not looking so bad so we re relax things and now we in a situation where infections are only once every five days but that would still be a reasonably infectious disease would be like R0 being two so again it starts to rise too fast you have another intervention not quite as serious a lockdown as the first one. And so the numbers start to drop again. And eventually it reaches a point, again, where we're not so con concerned about the number of cases. We relax the measures again. And again, we allow people to mix more than before more people stop worrying about masking or whatever other concerns and you know so it can keep going like this that we go through cycles of interventions and relaxation and at the end of the run of this example of this particular example you'll note our original herd immunity point at 60 percent uh, that keeps shifting around with the various interventions because we're faking the effect of a disease with a low r0 but what I want you to note is at the end of the simulation, the recovered group is less than 30%. So we're still well below the herd immunity point. And these successive peaks and declines are not a factor of how the disease is behaving. They're a consequence of interventions and then relaxing the interventions. So I would argue it's wrong to call them waves because the surges and peaks are a result of the NPIs and then relaxing them. And we get tired of distancing, mark, masking and so on, but the old COVID bug doesn't. And big outbreaks make new variants likely, so we do need to carry on being careful. So a few other myths that no, it's not seasonal. South Africa had peaks in summer and winter, 
and so have many other countries. There's no miracle cure. We'll go into this a bit more later. Hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, uh, both popped up on the radar, and one other I'll also mention. And there's no evidence that they're sufficiently effective to make a real difference. And the final one is it's not just the elderly. The older you are, the more likely it is to be serious, the more likely you are to die. But there are young people who do get it badly, even if it's less likely, and new variants can change it, as we saw in the... Uh, the October surge, there was a big increase then of younger people getting it and slightly higher fraction of younger people getting it badly. All right, so instant experts. They don't get the basics of epidemiology. The kind of description I showed you back there was not something they talk about at all. They don't also don't understand how unbiased drug trials work. So let's go through this. So the fake epidemiologists don't understand why interventions flatten the curve. They claim lockdowns cause more harm than good and keep arguing it's over when, it, when it's not. You have a particular homegrown bunch of these people who call themselves panda, who get these extremely gushing press reports, or you know, governments have COVID-19 data analysis horribly wrong, so African number experts must read. So what sort of number experts are these? Or well, most of this group are actuaries. And here's one of the claims they made in this uh, article back in May. I'm just going to highlight the critical point of, of this article. We are left wondering why anybody in their right minds would be talking up a story that involves anything more than 10,000 deaths for South Africa with or without a lockdown. So they're saying even without a lockdown, we wouldn't get more than 10,000 deaths. The actual official number now is over 50,000. And Many believe that that number is grossly undercounted. If you look at another statistic called excess deaths, which counts how many people have died more than every year, that's actually more like 150,000. And so this is the site where the story appeared. And again, as I said earlier, if anyone's interested, I can pass on a list of links. So on to miracle cures. I don't know if any of you remember the Madagascar cure. I'll go into that briefly. There's hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. So the Madagascar cure was announced with great fanfare early on April. And I looked at more detail of the story. It was tested on less than 20 people and alleged to have cured two. And, you know, stop and give pause here. Wait, now, wait a minute. This is a disease where the overwhelming majority get it relatively mildly. You take any sample of 20 people, the odds are they will just get better without any medication at all. So did it work? Well, let's have a look at where Madagascar now is in terms of the pandemic. Remember, the entire population were encouraged to, to drink this uh, miracle cure. And there we have the current, the active case count. And, you know, it's not a huge pandemic, but Madagascar is a relatively small population, very rural, so you wouldn't expect the same massive rapid growth, but the uh, current number currently infected is currently on a very steep uphill climb. So hydroxychloroquine. This is also, as it happens, an anti-malaria drug, a very small fully conducted study, this time in France, showed a benefit. Populist politicians pushed it. There was a massive social media campaign uh, pressurizing regulators to endorse it. It was at least partially <coughs> endorsed by some regulators, such as in the United States. Uh, and eventually, bigger, more careful studies showed that it had no significant effect. And because it has some potentially serious side effects, uh, it's now no longer recommended as a treatment. And you know, there's a paper that quite comprehensively goes through all of the uh, history of hydroxychloroquine from the massive pressure on the regulators through to eventually taking it off the list in many, but not all countries. There's some countries where it's still a recommended drug, even though on average, it has no significant benefit, and there are cases, you know, such as people with cardiac issues where it can actually actively be harmful. The ivermectin, a very similar story, 
It's an extremely effective drug against uh, invertebrate parasites, worms, insects, and the like. It's very widely used in agriculture. It's, it's been extremely successful in suppressing a disease called river blindness in the tropics. And so we had a lot of small-scale studies. Most of you drill down to the detail are very poorly conducted. You can't actually even assess whether there's bias there because too little detail is supplied. And we're still awaiting better studies. Now, there have been this, a large number of these small studies with 50, 20, 100 participants, some which show significant benefit, but slightly bigger studies don't. So some people are arguing we can just stitch together all the small studies and it amounts to being equivalent to a big study. So what I would do is illustrate for you with something I hope is slightly more easier to understand than a drug study, coin tosses. Now, we all know if you toss a coin, this is the classic example of a 50-50 probability, the odds are even whether it should be a head or a tail. And if you do it often enough, the number of heads and the number of tails should be exactly the same, maybe plus or minus a very small fraction. And so let's do a thought experiment. Let's announce we are testing whether coin tossing in general is biased. We send out a call to the entire world inviting everyone to cost, toss 10 coins and report. And particularly we're saying we don't believe there's a bias here, but we really want to do the science and test it. And we take the first 100 results. So what you'd expect is a distribution like this, that the overwhelming majority will get five heads out of 10 coin tosses, a slight fraction will get four or six, and a very small number will get three or seven, and pretty much close to zero will get less than three or more than seven. All right, so that's pretty standard stuff. Now let's see if we can make a little bias in the study. Let's announce, we have research that shows that Friday the 13th is actually a lucky day, and there's significantly more coin tosses that come up heads. So next time a Friday the 13th rolls around, you put out the same call, to big fanfare announcing we're going to demonstrate once and for whether Friday the 13th is really a lucky day. Ask everyone we can to toss 10 coins and report in and take the first 100 results that come in. So what would we expect? Would we get this again? Well, let's see what results we actually get. Oops, why not what we expected? Well, let's see why did we get this bias towards more than five as being the number of, the people, of heads people counted? Well, there's a thing called publication bias, that people are more likely to report the result that's more positive, closer to what people are expecting and so on. And in the context of a big pandemic, you know, everyone is talking about hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin is the next big thing. Somebody does a study of 10, 20, 50, or even 100 patients they get, this, get a successful result, they tell everyone. Don't get a successful result, less likely to talk about it. And so this is a significant problem in small-scale studies. And so adding up a lot of small-scale studies, even if they are not poorly conducted, is not a great way of checking for whether, for instance, a particular drug is effective or not. All right, so quick summary then. How can we tell if something is fake or junk science? It's often emotionally argued. There are also often personal attacks on scientists. And if it sounds like televangelist medicine, hallelujah, hallelujah, miracle cure, be suspicious, be very suspicious. The important thing to remember is all scientists are skeptics. So if somebody claims to be a a skeptic or the one true person who's calling everything into question, remember this is what all scientists do. It doesn't mean they never make mistakes. It doesn't mean that you know, research that goes through peer review with other scientists checking it is never junk. But somebody who claims they are the one person who's checking everything and everyone else is just a gullible fool, the odds are very high that they are wrong.